for this special programme, presented by David McCullough and Sinead O'Carroll, who are now going to take us back to this momentous day in 1922 for Treaty Live. January 7th, 1922. Tonight is a watershed moment for the Irish nation. One month ago, a delegation brought a peace deal home to Dublin from Downing Street, and in the coming hours, the Dáil decides whether to ratify or reject the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Will they vote for peace and accept a compromise of limited self-rule within the British Empire? Or will they insist on nothing less than a republic for all 32 counties and risk the resumption of war? This is a night that could change the course of Irish history forever and the outcome is too close to call. This is Treaty Live. Hello and welcome to Treaty Live, where we will track every twist and turn of tonight's landmark vote on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. We'll be talking to our panel of experts who will analyse the deal that's on the table and they'll profile the politicians pulling the strings on both sides of the Irish Sea. Sinead O'Carroll will be drilling deep into the detail of the last month of debates and explaining the roadblocks in the way of a united doll. And we'll be checking in live with our team of reporters at home and abroad. They'll bring us the breaking news as it happens, as well as instant reaction from the key players. But first, Ian Keegan reports on the journey taken to this fork in the road. The Anglo-Irish Treaty an historic moment that could change the course of Ireland's future and transform this country's relationship with Britain. The first treaty between these neighboring islands since the Normans landed in the 12th century. But will it be ratified or consigned to history? We've had weeks of debate and division. Now, it's finally a day for decision. After years of political manoeuvring around the question of home rule, the Easter Rising of 1916 changed the conversation, declaring an independent republic. The election of 1918 saw a resounding victory for Sinn Féin, who chose not to send MPs to Westminster, but to form a breakaway government in Dublin. Many would see 1916 as the foundational event for the so-called War of Independence. But arguably, it really grew from the electoral mandate that was given to the Republican separatist movement in 1918. On the 21st of January, 1919, the day the first doll was formed, two RIC officers were killed in an ambush in Solahead Beg, County Tipperary. With the refusal of the British to recognize the Doyle, a violent struggle was perhaps inevitable. Solahad Beg may have been an isolated, unplanned and unsanctioned attack, but many now see it as the first blow of the war that was to come. There were reprisals. That's what happens, you know, tit for tat. And they went and sent in the auxiliaries and the black and tans to support the RIC. Sure, they were no more than a paramilitary force lawn to themselves. All they did was add fuel to the fire. Mr. Churchill felt that he had no option but to provide ongoing support amid escalating violence. Certainly mistakes were made, but sometimes one must fight fire with fire. By the middle of 1920, the violence had intensified. The British administration in most of Ireland had all but collapsed. Their only way of maintaining order in some places was to impose martial law. You know, there's a saying in politics, if you're explaining, you're losing. Well, if you're imposing martial law, when it comes to winning hearts and minds, you can be full sure you're losing. It's not a matter of winning or losing. If one side is going to flout law and order, then there will be a proportionate response. If one side is going to fight a dirty war, abandon a fair fight and not even identify as combatants, then they shouldn't be surprised if the authorities sometimes react accordingly. By the middle of last year, with the war approaching stalemate, both sides agreed to a truce, which has been in effect since July. In October, 
Ireland sent five official delegates to London to negotiate with the British government. With President of the Declared Republic, Eamon de Valera, controversially choosing to remain in Dublin. After two months of complex and somewhat sporadic negotiations, an historic deal was reached. If passed, it will offer Ireland a limited form of independence within the British Empire and ensure some form of partition remains, in the short term at least. For some, the treaty is a sensible compromise that is preferable to war and a stepping stone to further independence. For others, it leaves Ireland subject to the Crown and swearing allegiance to the King, an unforgivable betrayal of the Republic. Which side will get to shape Ireland's fate? Tonight, we find out. Well, we will find out, and we will find out tonight. But right now, the dominant mood music seems to be uncertainty. No one can predict which way the doll will vote. Helping us to find our way through the fog, I'm joined now by historians Neve Gallagher and Mark uh, Duncan. Neve, as we've seen there in that report, you just can't underestimate the importance of tonight's vote. It is momentous. Yeah, tonight, David, I think, is the most important moment in this country's history in 120 years. Really, it's a question of whether 26 counties of Ireland are going to gain a substantial measure of independence from Britain, finally leaving that entity, the United Kingdom, which has been so hated and detested for such a long time, or if not, face renewed war yet again with Britain, following what's already happening elsewhere on the European continent right now. So really this treaty is going to decide tonight, one way or another, how we're gonna move forward. But whatever happens tonight, Mark, we are going to see a change because ever since that crushing electric, electoral victory, Sinn Féin has presented a united face to the world. That unity is now shattered. Absolutely. I'm certain for many of our viewers tonight, particularly those from a nationalist background, the most dispiriting aspect of the last number of weeks has been the depth of the divisions that have been exposed and also the very bitter and personal nature of some of the exchanges that they've been reading about in the Dáil chamber, chamber. I think some fracturing of that unity that you've been talking about was in some ways inevitable. The rapid rise of Sinn Féin as a political force since 1917 was as a grand coalition, which was never going to actually hold together once we entered a phase where compromise and principle was acquired. But I do think the depth of the divisions that we're seeing now owe an awful lot of, to the strength of the personalities that have lined up on both sides of this divide. Look at the names. Eamon de Valera, Michael Collins, Arthur Griffiths, all individuals who command huge uh, political loyalty and public support. OK, well, we will find out, as I say, within the next couple of hours. But at the moment, the result hangs in the balance. Large crowds are gathering outside UCD in Earlsford Terrace, where the doll is sitting. But inside the building, TDs are expected to vote shortly. So let's cross over there now to our parliamentary correspondent, Greta Sinnott. It's been a long day at the end of a long month of tetchy debates. Yes, David, I'm here outside this special sitting of Dáil Éireann at University College Dublin. There's a full house inside and we've heard heated arguments for and against the treaty, but the debates are now reaching their conclusion and we're expecting them to rise to vote within the hour. Now, as it stands, there is no consensus on which way the vote is likely to go, as many TDs have yet to declare, leaving a significant level of uncertainty. And Greta, can you tell us where exactly that uncertainty is coming from? For one example, we have the case of Clonmel TD Frank Drohan, who just two days ago resigned his seat rather than contribute further to the division in the Dáil. Having initially declared himself to be anti-treaty, he told me earlier that he couldn't vote against the wishes of his strongly pro-treaty constituency. If individual TDs are unable to decide, it goes some way to highlighting the difficulty of the task faced by the Assembly today. We'll bring you a result as soon as we have it. OK, Greta, we look forward to that moment and we will talk to you later. Now, Sinead O'Carroll has been crunching the numbers on the Dáil arithmetic and counting the cost of the war that led up to tonight's vote. Now, any analysis of tonight's vote starts with the question, how did we get here? Altogether, 2,346 people have been killed in Ireland since 1917. But let's break that down a little bit further. Police forces, the Irish military and the British military have all suffered in the region of 500 fatalities each. 
However, almost 1,000 of those who lost their lives have been civilians. And perhaps it is this figure of innocence caught in the crossfire that's created a clear feeling of battle fatigue all over the country. And that plays into tonight's vote, the biggest decision these TDs have faced together. In total, there are 125 Sinn Féin members in the Dáil, but they won't all cast a ballot tonight. Westmead's Lawrence Ganil is still on mission in Argentina. Dubliner Thomas Kelly is absent with illness. And Frank Drohan, as we heard from Greta earlier, has resigned. He's conflicted by the differences in his own instincts and the wishes of his constituents. It's worth noting too that the Cairn Corla own McNeil will abstain. Unless, of course, it's a tie and we can't rule out that possibility yet. So all of that leaves us with a magic number of 61 votes that either side must reach to win. This one will go to the wire and absolutely nobody is prepared to call it just yet. Back to you, David. Thanks, Sinead. Um, Mark, the deal on offer tonight has been criticised over the course of the last month in the debates, but it is worth remembering that it goes much further than anything that was offered in any of the previous Home Rule bills. Yes, there is no suggestion that this is Home Rule for slow learners. This is a very different kind of arrangement for Ireland. It establishes an Irish free state over the 26 counties, with a parliament make laws for Irish people. It establishes an Irish army, an Irish police force. We assume control over our financial affairs and over the education of our children. And our flag will join the nations of the world, those of the other recognised nations of the world. More immediately, um, if I can borrow from Arthur Griffith and the Dáil earlier today, it will drive the British army into the sea. And with them, you can assume they'll be taking the auxiliaries and the black and tans who've been terrorising our local communities for the last number of years. And yet, Neve, there is still this question of the Crown, the link with the Crown, and what's been characterised during the course of these debates as the oath of allegiance to the Crown. Yes, David, this is possibly the most controversial clause in the treaty, and I've got a copy here. And it's really worthwhile just having a look at this language. I do solemnly swear true faith and allegiance to the constitution of the Irish Free State. That is the very first clause in this treaty, and that's what many of the pro-treaty side are saying is important. But it's the second clause in this that's really problematic. As by law established, and that I will be faithful to His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors by law. And it is this pledge of faithfulness, i.e. a pledge of fidelity, called an oath of allegiance by those against this treaty, that's proved the most controversial sticking point in these debates. OK, Mark, we will be talking a lot more about partition, about the question of the North of Ireland later uh, in the, in the programme, in our discussion. But it is worth noting that in the Dáil debates, partition didn't really get a look in. That's because on the North, this treaty resolves absolutely nothing. The Ulster issue was one which dogged home rule for over four decades. And rather than confront it up, up front uh, uh, at this stage, the treaty negotiators have decided to kick that can down the road. We already have a Northern Ireland government and parliament. It was set up, uh, set up last summer. That Northern Ireland government has the right to step out of the Irish Free State and it will do so but at a cost. It will trigger the creation of a boundary commission which will look again at the border between north and south of this island. Now that may provide some comfort to northern nationalists who've borne the brunt of the violence that has accompanied the birth of Northern Ireland, but it will anger and dismay unionist politicians. Neve, um, constitutional issues, constitutional status, it does provoke a lot of passion and we've seen that passion in the Dáil over the past uh, month or so. Yeah. But for a lot of viewers watching this programme, ordinary people living their lives, they might be more interested in the powers to make decisions for themselves. Absolutely, they might be. And they might be sorely disappointed that none of these things have been spoken about. Social and economic concerns, the bread and butter of everyday life, haven't even had a look in. Now, the pro-treaty side have been saying, look, we are where we are, we're going to move forward and we'll address these sorts of issues. Whereas the anti-treaty side have been looking back and saying, what were the last two years for? Between them, neither of them address everyday life and how the new Ireland, one way or another, might look for the ordinary person. OK, Mark, um, the stakes really couldn't be higher because if this treaty is rejected, we could be back at war. Uh, we could. Uh, I don't think any of us here envy the weight of responsibility that the TDs and the Dáil uh, bear tonight. Uh, and in reality, both of them are taking a gamble with the future of Ireland. They're rolling a dice uh, on, on an outcome they, they cannot be sure of. To ratify this treaty, we're trusting in the judgment of Arthur Griffith and Michael Collins that it will provide a pathway to a fuller form of freedom. To reject it, 
We're testing the seriousness of Lloyd George's threat, and there's no other way to characterise it, that he will inflict immediate and devastating war upon Ireland. And that's a war for which the Irish public, weary after years of disruption and death and loss, may not be actually prepared for. OK, well, we're going to find out very shortly, hopefully, but this really is shaping up to be a cliffhanger. Join us after the break when we bring you every development as it happens. Welcome back to Treaty Live as we wait on the Dáil's decision on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now, much of the discussion and division surrounding tonight's historic vote has centred on two very different characters who are on opposite sides of the argument. Eamon de Valera and Michael Collins have come to be known in some quarters as the chief and the big fella. Greta Sinnott went in search of the men behind the myths. The debates of the past month have laid bare a major new division within Irish nationalist politics. Pro-treaty versus anti-treaty. Pragmatists versus idealists. Collins versus De Valera. Though both Collins and De Valera are potential leaders of any future Irish state, their opposing political positions have been shaped by their time abroad as much as their time in Ireland. For Collins, that formational time was spent in London, once in his youth and later when he returned for the treaty negotiations. He arrived when he was about 15, I think. Very bright young man, eager to learn, wanted to know everything right away. Many people assume those years fostered animosity towards the British, but it's also possible to see them as formative of Collins' political pragmatism. It wasn't just the post office or the bank he was interested in. It was the workings of the whole civil service. I thought it was ambition. I suppose, in hindsight, it feels more like it was some kind of reconnaissance. His time in London taught him the importance of organisation. Building the apparatus of the state, the spirit of party. But we can see that in the way he used the IRB to engineer his political position. Then again, de Valera was no stranger to pulling strings either. Support the war heroes! Eamon de Valera was born in America, and for many, this has always made him an outsider. But it was arguably his return to the USA that has shaped his current opposition to the treaty. He spent a full year and a half in the States, raising money and awareness. 18 months of adulation. They came in their droves to see him. 70,000 people in Fenway Park in Boston, out to see the President of the Republic. And then he comes back to find that Collins has become some sort of mythical hero all of a sudden. It was all very seductive being treated as a leader. Of course, some have speculated that fame wasn't the only thing that seduced him. If de Valera's time in America hardened his stance, Colin's recent return to London arguably softened his. We have always been supporters of the Irish cause, so we were more than happy to have Michael and the whole delegation over to socialise. It was exciting. The press were crazy about him. Man of mystery. What can I say? He was great company. You could tell he'd been hardened by everything. Perhaps he softened a bit here. Maybe he saw people on the other side with whom he could do business. This whole reputation is hard to stomach, as if he's some mysterious mastermind, all cloak and dagger. He's a propaganda man for himself. He didn't win the war. Let's not forget that the IRA brought the Brits to the table and Richard Mulcahy is Chief of Staff and Cahill Brewer is Minister for Defence. If nobody can agree who won the war, even fewer can agree who won the negotiations. He said it himself. He signed it because he didn't want to commit the Irish people to war, without the Irish people committing themselves to it. He signed it because he was bullied and threatened by Lloyd George. They were let a merry dance. Whatever happens with tonight's vote, it seems that the close and respectful relationship between these two men may struggle to withstand the strain of reaching across the aisle. 
Greta Sinnott there with a telling insight into the two men, each hoping to lead his side to victory tonight. Well, historians Neve Gallagher and Dermot Ferreter are with us now to take a closer look at the power plays at the heart of the London negotiations. Dermot, Greta touched on it there, but one of the themes of the debates over the past month has been who went and who didn't go to London. De Valera's decision not to go to London was hugely controversial. It remains hugely controversial. It'll be debated well into the future. To be fair to him, he was afforded the title President of the Irish Republic last summer. There was an argument to be made that he should remain in Dublin, untarnished in the event of a collapse of the talks, the idea that he might be able to rally a, a, a people around him. But the problem now is that that adulation that was referred to, that uh, almost blanket deference, is gone. And we have to remember, De Valera was in London, in Downing Street. He was talking to David Lloyd George, the Prime Minister, before the treaty negotiations began. Did he not get a measure of the man? Did he not know what was available and what was not available? So you have to consider that argument as well. Is this really now about political principle, his opposition to the treaty, or is it about wounded vanity and wounded pride? But it does seem he's miscalculated. And we could be witnessing the beginning of the end of the political career of Eamon de Valera tonight. If it is come to that, we don't know what the results of the vo vote will be yet. Neve, what about the other side of the table, the people representing the British Empire? You had some very experienced statesmen there. Yeah, this is a pretty formidable team. I mean, behind me, we have two of the key characters. We've got Lloyd George, David Lloyd George, the Welsh Prime Minister, been in the role since December 1916. He is heading up a coalition unionist government. So we've Winston Churchill here beside him, who is an up-and-coming young radical who you might remember his father, Randolph, in his very famous Ulster Will Fight and Ulster Will Be Right speech that was reported after 1886. And then the most hardline conservative of them all is Lord Birkenhead. He is Mr. No. No to home rule, no to changing the power of the House of Lords, no to disestablishing the Church of England and Wales, clearly no to Irish home rule up until now. So he's really important in these negotiations because he's keeping those rowdy conservative backbenchers together in supporting a treaty from the British side. So it's a really formidable team. OK, but at the end of the day, we are told that the Prime Minister threatened the plenipotentiaries, sign this or you face immediate and terrible war within three days. If they signed under duress, Rest. Can it be taken as, as, as a, a, a fair treaty? I mean, on the one hand, you might remember that we're in the period of a truce right now, and that means effectively a moment or a pause in hostilities. So clearly, if these negotiations feel we're back to conflict. So in that sense, he's being a realist and saying the negotiations feel we're back to war. But is he threatening a much larger war, i.e. throwing the empire's might onto Ireland? I mean, I don't know what Dermot thinks about this, but I think he's probably bluffing. There is not the military capacity right now to throw all of the empire might well, that's only part of it. I mean, we also need to be careful not to do the Irish negotiators a grave injustice by depicting them as being sitting ducks, as being weak, as being callow. We have this formidable heavyweight <sighs> British negotiating team. The Irish delegates were led by Arthur Griffith, the founder of Sinn Féin. He lit the furnace of Sinn Féin. And also the intellectual underpinning of Sinn Féin came from Arthur Griffith and it the did. ideas. Did, Michael yeah. Collins, the last time I checked, is no half-wit either. So we have to begin to think about the dilemma that they face, the moral dilemma, the political dilemma, but also to acknowledge their own stature, their own considerable abilities, what they achieved is not insubstantial. No, it's not. And, Jeremy, you're putting words in my mouth here. I never said that about any of them. No, but you're, you're talking been, about this... Please, please, this sorry, you're don't in interrupt awe. me for a second. You're in awe of this British negotiation. Let her finish Can Jeremy, I please finish my point? I mean, for years, the Irish representatives have been successfully elected time and again. What they have achieved is incredible. Nobody can doubt that. But you are very narrow-sighted if you think that there's an equivalence on geopolitical power play right now. OK, well, I'm afraid we're not going point. to relitigate the entire treaty debate here, but I think that gives a flavour of the divisions over these issues, but thank you both very much. Now, given that five of the 18 articles in the treaty mention Northern Ireland, many people have been wondering why the Ulster question featured so little in the debates in recent weeks. Here's Sinead O'Carroll to provide some answers. Now, the second doll is effectively a government on the run, so the last month has offered TDs a rare chance to have their say, and they have been embracing that opportunity with gusto. 
There may be just 1,800 words in the treaty brought home from London, but the record of the Dáil will show that TDs have racked up almost half a million words in the last month, arguing the case for and against it. And what they haven't been talking about is almost as interesting as what has been on the agenda. Take a look at this. The words treaty, people and Ireland were all uttered over 1,000 times on the floor of the parliamentary chamber. Perhaps tellingly though, the word unionists got a measly 38 mentions. And just nine of the 338 pages on the Dáil record contain any mention whatsoever of the issue of Northern Ireland. And that surely will concern the large nationalist populations in counties like Fermanagh and Tyrone and Armagh. And if Northern Nationalists were hoping for some peace of mind from the summer elections, reassurance was in short supply. In that vote, Nationalist parties received almost one third of all the votes, but that left them with less than a quarter of all the seats in the new Northern Irish Parliament. But remember, the Nationalists are not the only minority who suddenly feel outnumbered. The decision to leave three of Ulster's nine counties outside of the new Belfast administration has meant that an estimated 70,000 Protestants in Donegal, Cavan and Monaghan also feel stranded on the wrong side of the border. So given all the evidence that the Ulster question is far from answered, how can we explain its absence from these debates? Well, it seems to be based on an expectation that Article 12 of the treaty, which promises a future boundary commission, will settle this issue once and for all. But kicking that can down the road might well be storing up future troubles. David. Thanks, Sinead. Well, Neve Gallagher has left us and we're joined now by Freya McClements, the Northern Editor of the Irish Times, uh, who joins Dermot Ferreter. Freya, um, there has, of course, been a truce here for uh, several months, since July, and yet there's no truce, there's no peace in Belfast. In the north, there is no truce. People are still being killed in Ulster and particularly in Belfast. People like young boxer Walter Pritchard, we're talking about Edward Brennan, a 22-year-old carter who was shot in the head by a sniper as he was getting onto a tram. I know from my own experience, if you're heading into the centre of town on the tram in Belfast, in certain areas, the Short Strand, for example, everybody has to lie on the floor because of the bullets from snipers that are coming, going to come in through the window. And I mean, one that, that really hit home just around the corner from my grandmother's house, in the Ravenhill Road, only a few, few weeks ago, Frances Donnelly, mother of four, gang of loyalists called to the door looking for her husband. He wasn't there. They shot her and her young daughter instead. So when, when we're talking about the questions that lie ahead, the decisions around the treaty, you know, the question that is very much outstanding from the Northern point of view is simply what is going to come of all of this for Northern Ireland? Because so far, it certainly hasn't stopped the violence. And dear, despite that, despite that violence, uh, we saw from Sinead just uh, a minute ago, Ulster barely mentioned in, in the debates on the treaty, apparently because both sides of that argument believe that the Boundary Commission will solve the problem for them. One of the difficulties around the Boundary Commission is defining precisely what it is going to be if it comes to pass. There's a very ambiguous wording in the Boundary Commission about establishing the wishes of the inhabitants. I mean, there are a border people now, a new border people, but how do you establish their wishes? Are they consulted? Do they vote directly? Will there be a, a, a plebiscite? That really hasn't been teased out, but there is, it seems, a widespread belief that Fermanagh and Tyrone, for example, because they have nationalist majorities, uh, could well be a prize uh, on offer, but you're still going to be uh, left with the unresolved uh, issue uh, of what happens to those who remain behind. We really have two minority issues now, don't we, on both sides of the border. The other issue, I think, is economic. It has been mentioned by a few deputies that North East Ulster, as they're calling it, will become so isolated economically that it just may not be a feasible economic entity. Well, Freya, I mean, it would appear that certain assurances have been given to the Irish plenipotentiaries by the Prime Minister, Mr uh, Lloyd George, and presumably if the Prime Minister of Great Britain gives assurances, they have to be relied upon. <laughs> Well, think about this from, from James Craig's point of view, you know, so he, he got what he, what he wanted, got Northern Ireland, but suddenly this question seems to have been opened up again with the potential of, of the Boundary Commission. But I mean, you know, and, and Dermot's absolutely right. What, what does this actually mean? You know, you look at the language here of, of the treaty, you know, so, so the, the Boundary Commission, you know, sh shall determine where this, this border shall run in accordance with the wishes of the inhabitants, so far as may be compatible with economic and geographic conditions. I mean, what, what does that actually mean? mean you know geographic con conditions you know yeah. does that mean we you know we don't yeah. cross rivers does that
that mean you know the small part of Derry City that's yeah. on the west bank of the foil? Yeah. You Isn't know, there where, a sense where does they, that go? They're not interested in teasing that out because, yeah. as some of them would see it, until they sort out the fight with England, they're going to leave Ulster to one side until that fundamental issue, as they see it, uh, is 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 settled or resolved, Ulster is almost a kind of a sideshow. Yeah, and in the meantime, you have a lot of Northern nationalists who are very uncertain, who are very fearful. You also have Southern Protestants on the other side of the border, equally nervous, equally fearful. OK, well, we will uh, hear more from you later, but thank you both for uh, the time being anyway. So many people are wondering whether this future Boundary Commission can possibly deliver all things to all men or whether a hard border might partition the island of Ireland. Let's cross over live now to Jonathan Gregory in Belfast fast who I believe is with Northern Ireland's Prime Minister James Craig. Jonathan. Thank you David. Yes I'm here with the Prime Minister of Northern Ireland Sir James Craig. Sir James will you respect and support whatever decision the Dáil comes to today? In due course we will recognise the Parliament that emerges from the treaty if indeed it is ratified. But we've got our own Parliament up here so I won't interfere in southern politics and I would expect the same respect in return. But didn't you travel to London last November to agitate against the treaty? It could be argued that that was a form of interference in itself. We were simply lobbying, as is our right, that there would be no deal that would see us rule from Dublin. We got what we wanted and will remain separate from any so-called free state. Can I ask you then about the Boundary Commission? Many in Dublin feel the Commission will overturn the current border and award Catholic majority areas to the south. I can tell you now that what we have, we will hold. Regardless of the vote today, I promise you, I will sit on Ulster like a rock. OK, thank you, Sir James Craig. And on that defiant note, it's back to you, David. Okay, well, thank you very much for that, Jonathan. Uh, Dermot, as we saw there, I don't think James Craig is open to too much compromise, is he? No, and the Ulster Unionists are well practiced at sloganeering. We heard earlier on about Ulster will fight, Ulster will be right. Now it is what we have, we hold. There's no reason to doubt his conviction and sincerity around the idea of, of holding on to what he has, to making this new Northern Ireland in, impregnable. And yet, I'm suspicious of that defiance. I suspect. It's covering a degree of vulnerability. I don't think James Craig trusts David Lloyd George or the British government any more than Eamon de Valera does. And he's conscious, of course, of the irony, even though he wouldn't admit it. They're the ones who ended up with home rule. His whole formation, political formation, military formation, was around the idea of, of defending the whole of Ireland's place in the Union. So there are vulnerabilities there. And the question of how long he can continue to control the situation in Northern Ireland, given the violence that Freya was talking about earlier on. And the Ulster IRA hasn't gone away. OK, uh, but Freya, I mean, the unions would expect that they would have a certain level of influence uh, in London and they would hope that that influence would uh, be, be to their advantage. I mean, absolutely. You know, the relationship that the Ulster Unionists have with Westminster is a really close one. You know, the, there are family ties, there are school ties, there are parliamentary ties. Uh, you know, he knows a lot of members of, of the, the British government personally. They're, they're friends and, and they are colleagues. But, you know, for all he can sound defiant, for all he can talk about, you know, sitting on Ulster like, like a rock, the reality is, is that he is surrounded by disloyal elements as he would see yeah. it w within and, and without. There's the question of what will the British government do? Because the British government's priority really isn't yeah. Northern Ireland. And they just want money, this sorted. He? he needs yeah, money. He, he, he needs money. There's also there's the question of the ongoing violence and what does he do about this disloyal new state as he would have it south of the border and this yeah. disloyal, potentially treacherous minority with, with, within his own borders. And I mean, unless he starts to get a, a grip on some of this, you know, that Ulster Rock could very well start to. And there are plenty in London who are fed up with James Indeed. Craig and the Ulster Unionists. They would have wanted to settle what they call the Irish question, meaning the whole of the island, off the table at Downing Street. OK, well, they might hear more about the Ulster question in the years to come. Who knows? Dermot and Freya, thank you both indeed for that. After the break, we turn east to get a sense of what the British press and the British public have been making of it all. Join us shortly.
You're very welcome back to Treaty Live. Tonight, the nation holds its breath as one of the most important arguments in Irish history comes to a climax with a winner-takes-all vote on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. And according to every observer, the verdict is just too close to call. As soon as there are any developments in Earlsford Terrace, we'll go straight there live. But of course, the result is eagerly awaited, not just here in Ireland, but also in Westminster, where a comprehensive settlement to the Irish question has eluded successive British governments. Ian Keegan reports. Well, here in London, Downing Street is all but empty, with Lloyd George and many of his closest advisers at the International Conference in Cannes. So the men who brokered this treaty face an anxious wait for news of tonight's vote in Dublin to travel slowly to the south of France. Indeed, the earliest reaction is likely to be here, in the West End, where important breaking news is often relayed to cinema and theatre goers during intervals. The treaty has already been ratified here in Britain, but there is a keen awareness in the political sphere that it matters little if it isn't passed in Dublin. As I've been finding out, the British public has long had an uneasy relationship with their neighbours to the West. The issue of Irish independence has been a thorn in the side of Westminster politics for centuries. For as long as I can remember, this Parliament has been unduly preoccupied with the affairs in Ireland. In the course of the past 50 years, the British government has made a series of concessions on land reform, seen the introduction of successive home rule bills, and dealt with the endless debates and protests against each of those bills. Quite frankly, the resolution of the Irish question is long overdue. As the people of London contemplate the merits of the peace settlement with Ireland, it isn't so much a question of how the British view the treaty as how they view Ireland itself. Well, I don't know, aren't they supposed to be part of our country? No. They've got their own country, don't they? No. It's just part of the empire, isn't it? No, they're part of the UK, just like us. How do you make a treaty with yourselves? We wouldn't make a treaty with Yorkshire, would we? Don't get me wrong, I'm glad the war's over, but it was more of a civil war, when you think about it. We just want to be done with it. Let them have their country if they want it. They can stop interfering in ours. I don't know why we've done a deal with them. After everything that went on, my nephew Freddie, he brought the son, come out alive, sent the county Tipperary, killed in an ambush she was, left to bleed out on the side of the road. Tell me, eh, what kid deserves that? I'd wager that 99 out of 100 English people will be grateful for the treaty. And a lot of that gratitude wouldn't be noble. It would be a kind of good riddance to the whole sorry situation. You see this orange? This was imported from Italy. Do you know how many trade links and treaties it takes so that this orange can make here at a price that anyone on this street can afford? How many? I don't know, but it's a lot. Exactly. I say good luck to them if they think they can leave the union and go it alone. Mm. Let's see how that works out. People act like we ought to be celebrating, be rid of it all. Look at the price we paid, eh? The human cost. And for what? To give them their way. But I'm not celebrating anything. If you want to know how people feel about this, you only have to look at the Westminster numbers. The House of Commons voted overwhelmingly in favour of the treaty, 401 to 58, an absolute landslide. It's really quite rare to see that kind of consensus. I think that says it all. The British government aren't worried about losing Ireland. They're more concerned about weakening the empire. I think they should be more worried about the fallout and the vision that this will leave over there. Here in London, it's hard to see how the English public view Ireland as anything other than an unwanted problem child. And it is the politicians who have made perhaps the most emphatic statement of all voting overwhelmingly in favour of removing the Irish question from British politics. Tonight's vote will reveal if the stage is set for what is, by all accounts, a long overdue separation. Ian Keegan there with The View from London. But what might an amicable divorce mean for the rest of the British Empire? Sinead is mapping the possibilities. Thanks, David. 
Now, the terms of the Anglo-Irish Treaty have been in negotiation for almost six months. And if it is ratified tonight, it will represent a truly watershed moment for the empire. An empire that is bigger and stronger than ever before after the Treaty of Versailles granted mandates for the British to control multiple new colonial territories. In fact, tonight, as the Dáil votes, roughly a quarter of the world's population, 458 million people, remain under British rule. But they're not all necessarily happy subjects of George V. In the east of the empire, an Afghan uprising was defeated in 1919 when the air power of the newly formed Royal Air Force was unleashed. And across the Khyber Pass, the carrot of a Government of India Act has attempted to appease the agitation of nationalists with a set of democratic reforms. Meanwhile, just last year in the newly formed territory of Iraq, a revolt that started in Baghdad was ruthlessly extinguished by aerial bombardment. And last month, martial law was imposed in Egypt to suppress street demonstrations there. But the guerrilla tactics of Irish nationalists has earned them more success and the offer of dominion status. That's a limited form of self-governance within the empire that is already enjoyed by New Zealand and Australia, South Africa and Newfoundland and Canada. Winston Churchill, the man who sent the Black and Tans into Ireland, was a key influence in the decision to deploy the Royal Air Force in Iraq. But the British have thus far chosen not to deploy aerial firepower upon its near neighbours in Ireland. But if the treaty is rejected tonight, might Lloyd George's threat of immediate and terrible war within three days change all of that? David. Thanks, Sinead. Well, we're going live now to Dr. Jyoti Aswal in New Delhi in India. Dr. Aswal, thanks indeed for joining us. We were just hearing about other parts of the empire that are looking for independence. Do you think tonight's moment of truth in Dublin is going to have resonance in India? Well, of course, David. Many people here in India are keeping a close eye on the unfolding of events in Ireland tonight. Ever since the mutiny of Irish soldiers of the Connaught Rangers during the summer, which resulted uh, you know, in the execution of James Daly, there has been an awakened sense of solidarity for many Indians with the Irish nationalist struggle. And several newspapers here in India uh, in recent months have been providing ongoing bulletins of the negotiations in London and the debates in Dublin. Now, we've had three years of violence here in Ireland because of the independence struggle, but at the same time, India has been suffering as well. We too have been experiencing since the end of the war a violence uh, which is unleashed by the colonial state. Uh, nearly 1,500 people were killed in the Amritsar massacre uh, when in a situation uh, very much like your own Bloody Sunday in Croke Park in Dublin, uh, the British troops opened fire on innocent civilians. But do you think Indians will follow the Irish playbook or will Gandhi try to pursue a peaceful path? Uh, there is a difference in the tactics adopted by our emerging leader, Gandhi. In many ways, uh, his approach is opposite of the guerrilla warfare tactics embraced by Michael Collins uh, and the Sinn Féin. Incidentally, I should remind you that one of Gandhi's most trusted allies in this mission is an Irish woman, the suffragette Margaret Cousins. She is at present preparing Indian women as candidates uh, for forthcoming municipal elections. Nobody really knows how these events will pan out uh, in India or Ireland. But I have a feeling tonight this might well be the beginning of the end of the Great British Empire. Dr. Atwell, thank you indeed for joining us this evening. Well, Freya McClements is still with us. We're also joined by leading political analyst Gary Murphy. Freya, as we heard there from Dr. Atwell, this story, tonight's vote, that we're still waiting for the results, it is a big story right around the world. Yeah, there's been huge, huge interest in this internationally, and I can absolutely guarantee whatever the result is tonight, it's going to be on front pages around the world. And, and, and why, why is this? I mean, Dr. Atwell summed this up really, really well. It's because of precisely what's at stake here. 
you know, could this be the first crack in the British Empire? But you can uh, also see you can also see why propaganda is so important to the to the British. Uh, we had a great example of of Amritsar, which was a terrible uh, blow to the prestige and of the British Empire. And um, yeah, that's why Britain is uh, so obsessed with Ireland tonight. Okay, well, Britain is obsessed with Ireland. Ireland, I suppose, is obsessed with Britain. But another key player in all of this, right the way through this uh, independence movement, has been the USA. Yeah, Irish nationalism has looked to the United States since, since 1798, basically. But the current American administration, the presidency of Warren Harding, uh, the Republican administration in Congress, they want this treaty uh, passed. And if the treaty is rejected, uh, Irish America, America as a whole, will be a cold place, I think, for... Uh, for Irish nationalists. Frey, we've heard a lot of talk in the Dáil over the last month of the fighting men, the, you know, the, the importance of, of, of the armed struggle. But what we've just been talking about, it illustrates that it's been very much a propaganda war more than anything. Yeah, and in fairness, you know, there's been propaganda on both sides. I mean, the, the, the Irish know it. We've seen it in, in terms of the Irish bulletin, what's been put out there. But I mean, the British really know it. And, and this was dramatically revealed a few months ago. Viewers will, will remember a Pathé newsreel, which supposedly showed the aftermath of a battle in, in Tralee and in, in County Kerry. And of course, this was a great victory for the British Crown forces. And there were, there were bodies of rebels lying in, in the street. This was revealed to be an elaborate fake which had been staged by the press team at, at Dublin Castle in Vico Road in, in Kalini of all places. And, and what gave it away was supposedly was the fact that one of the corpses moved, you know. So, you know, a propaganda war, a pretty dirty propaganda war. You know, we, and we've seen just how fake news is being used at the forefront of this battle to manipulate public opinion. Gary, what's going on in the media is clearly important, but what's going on on the ground is important too. And how has that been influential in the last couple of weeks? Well, it's been very influential. There is a split between the, the sort of the elite, the political representatives of the uh, of the, 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 the citizenry of uh, of Ireland, and uh, I think that's very uh, very important. And we know there is a whole raft of. Uh, anti-treaty uh, TDs who are not local to their own constituencies. And we also know, I think, for, and, and I know this for myself from my travels uh, back to Cork uh, for Christmas, um, that the tide seems to be turning on, on, on the ground. Uh, we can see local chambers of commerce are meeting, um, Sinn Féin clubs are meeting, local authorities are meeting. Um, and what they're talking about is, as uh, Dr Gallagher said earlier, they're talking about social and economic issues. They're not talking about abstract concepts of dominion status or independence. You know, they want to get on with their lives. And I think that's a really important issue for those who are voting tonight to consider. OK, well, hold that thought because we will come back to you in a minute. But you'd be glad to know, uh, Gary, that we are staying with Cork. Uh, and one of the most uncompromising Republicans in the second doll is Mary McSweeney. Just over a year ago, she watched her brother Terence die on hunger strike in Brixton Jail. And she's spent much of the time since fundraising across America for the independence cause. Our reporter Emmeline Dowling accompanied her over the Christmas break as she deployed her powers of persuasion closer to home in her Cork constituency. <laughs> Up and down the country over the past number of weeks, committees and councils have been meeting up to discuss and debate the treaty, deciding whether to endorse it or oppose it. In Cork today, it's the turn of the Chamber of Commerce. I suppose people might ask us, what's the point in voting? But we're in a situation where if there is a public referendum, it'll be after the Doyle vote. So how do people get the message through to the politicians? We represent the business people of Cork City and it is our role to send a message on their behalf. The four-seater Cork Borough constituency encompasses Cork City, a city that lies in the heart of the rebel county, in a corner of the country that has seen more death per capita than any other. It is no surprise then that here, perhaps more than anywhere else, the treaty has proved to be particularly divisive and consensus is hard to find. Mary McSweeney is one of the local TDs who strongly opposes the treaty. Gentlemen, people have said that this treaty kills the Republic. I've said it in Dáil Éireann and I'll say it again. Never, not a thousand documents could ever kill the Republic. It's not dead while there's a man woman or child left in Ireland. Liam de Rochta. He's going to be advocating today for the Chamber of Commerce to support this treaty. And then he's going to use it to justify going up to Dublin to ratify. That's why we need your help. 
to canvas him and let him know that we Republicans will continue this fight with the gloves off if this thing is passed. There are aspects of this treaty that I don't like, but talking to the man on the street down here, it's only convinced me that the people want this treaty. They want peace, they want normality. They're tired of the bloodshed. There isn't one of us here who hasn't been touched by tragedy. I've been targeted myself, Father James O'Callaghan, God rest his soul. He was shot dead when they raided my house. Mary McSweeney talks as if she has a monopoly on, on loss and sacrifice. We've all suffered. As far as I'm concerned, this treaty is the grossest act of betrayal that Ireland has ever endured. It's a betrayal of everything that my brother stood for and died for in Brixton Prison. I'm not a member of the Chamber of Commerce, but they'll soon see what I think of their petition. Independence isn't just a notion. It's a chance to rebuild our economy in our own interests. We won't be shackled by Britain. And I think a vote of support in here today will send a message to my fellow TDs in Dublin, and indeed in this constituency. The Chamber of Commerce vote is largely symbolic, but this meeting proved just how important symbolism can be. They're all going in favour, up and down the country. The will of the people is behind us. This isn't the will of the people, Liam. It's the fear of the people under threat of war. This, this is hope. We can build our culture back, or Jonga. What kind of culture is it that betrays its dead? That swears allegiance to the Republic, then switches to the King? I'm saying we can't let this treaty divide us. And you'd have us united under the crown. Hold on, what are you doing? That's a public petition for... Is this what you want? This kind of thing? I didn't ask for this. Everyone who put their name on that treaty did. I'll see you in Dublin. As one committee after another points towards ratification, it seems that the people of Cork remain as divided as the politicians that represent them. Emmeline Dowling reporting there. Freya, Mary McSweeney, who we saw there, one of only six women TDs in the Dáil. All six of them very strongly opposed to the treaty. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's going to be really interesting to see what the role of woman is in the Dáil and in public life in general in, in Ireland in, in the future and just how much involvement they're, they're going to have. Because absolutely, I mean, all six women, you know, very strongly anti-treaty. But, you know, let's remember... They all have a direct personal involvement in this. I mean, Mary McSweeney, Terence McSweeney's sister, you know, Margaret Pierce, she's there because her two sons were executed. You know, the, these are not your ordinary, everyday, run of the mill woman. And a thing that really struck me during the Doyle debates was just the tone of some of the deputies towards the, the, the woman. I mean, Mary McSweeney is called emotional at, at, at one stage. You know, that's not something that you would say to a male a TD. And I really wonder, you know, in this New Ireland that's, that's ahead of us, whatever shape and, and form that takes. You know, what's going to be the threshold for women to have a, a say in public life? You know, what, what are they going to have to do? What's it going to take for them to participate in public life on an equal footing to men? Okay. But, but I think we must, need, we must have some realism here about uh, the role of women in the, uh, in, in the treaty debates and the potential for, for a rejection of the treaty tonight and a resumption of war. Mary McSweeney does not speak for the women of Ireland. A thousand innocent civilians have died in Ireland over the course of the last number of years. And it's very easy, I think, uh, for all genders to suggest, you know, yeah, let's go back to war. And I mean, there's a grave responsibility tonight on those who are going to cast their vote. Uh, because going back to war, you know, it's, it's a solemn thing to, uh, to promise the people. Could I ask you about another point, Gary, uh, which, ha which has been mentioned, and that's the Christmas break. President de Valera was very keen to have the vote on the treaty before the doll rose for Christmas, because he was worried about the effect of, uh, of of the Christmas break on, on opinion within the doll. Do you think it has had that effect and will we see that tonight? I do think it has, has had a substantial effect on, on public opinion. Um, I, I think there was some shock across the country um, that the plenipotentiaries had come home without the 32 county uh, republic. Uh, and, and De Valier was playing on that to some extent. Now we've had a Christmas break and we've had importantly mass on Christmas day uh, and the message from the pulpit has been, you know, to accept the treaty. You know, uh, without 
forecasting the vote. I, I, I think public opinion in, in the country, the newspapers are now starting to um, editorialise pro-treaty and uh, that's how I think things might be looking at uh, in the next... 20 minutes or okay, so. Okay, well, we're going to find out very shortly, but thank you both indeed for that uh, for now. So, can the doll find common ground tonight or will fault lines emerge as divisions deepen? We may be about to find out. Greta, I believe there are some developments. Yes, indeed. We have just gotten word that Kian Corla Owen McNeil has risen to take the roll call and register the individual votes of all TDs. They will be called in alphabetical order of their constituency. And as luck would have it, first up is a TD from Cork, who also happens to hold a seat in Armagh. None other than Michael Collins. He will be voting to ratify. Will he set the trend? We're expecting a final result imminently. OK, Greta, thank you very much. And we will, of course, be back to you as soon as we get uh, news of those results. Well, the history of the future is about to be written. Don't go anywhere. The average amount of photographs before it goes up on an Instagram page in research is about 40, and you're comparing yourself to that curated life. Kickstart a healthy body and mind. Operation Transformation, Wednesday at 9.35 on RTE1 and RTE Player. This is the Dyson Corral Straightener with manganese copper alloy plates. Invented to flex, shape, and gather for enhanced styling. With reduced reliance on heat and even without a cord. Buy direct from the people who made it. Available from Dyson.ie. There's never been a better time to switch to Air's totally unlimited fibre broadband. Our strongest, most reliable broadband connection. Straight to the heart of your home. For just $34.99 a month, you can stream the latest movies, game to your heart's content and download your favourite music. Switching is easy with Ireland's number one broadband provider. Call 1-800-500-300, go in store or visit air.ie. Air. Let's make possible. Where is the sun? I can't line dry my daughter's outfit. Where is the my sun? My laundry's piling up. This room smells like an armpit. You think you got grief? Well, I'm running out of briefs. And the weatherman says, the sun when you have new Lenore Outdoorable to give your laundry that line dried freshness. Whatever the weather, new Lenore Outdoorable. Fresh as if dried outside. Welcome back to Treaty Live, where the Dáil has finally risen to vote on the Anglo-Irish Treaty. The future direction of the Irish nation hangs in the balance and we are expecting a result very, very soon. I'm joined again by historians Neve Gallagher and Dermot Ferreter. Dermot, what is the alternative here if the treaty is rejected? Are the opponents of the treaty really ready to go back to war? We don't really know how strong the IRA is at the moment. I mean, they've got very robust membership figures on paper. There are also a lot of people who seem to have joined after the truce of last summer, who are happy to come into the army after uh, the, the, the main period of conflict. The gravest challenge facing the country, I think, tonight, regardless of what way the vote goes, is maintaining army unity. We have heard ominous voices from members of the IRA who are also Sinn Féin TDs talking about the men who count. There's even been a suggestion that because it was the soldiers who fought for the Republic, who did the brunt of the fighting, that they should have a veto over constitutional change. It does seem that a majority of IRA members are opposed to the treaty, but you've also got to consider the stature of Michael Collins and other senior uh, IRA figures who will be, I suppose, hoping that that loyalty to them will count for a lot. Neve, we, we spoke earlier about whether or not Prime Minister Lloyd George was bluffing when he threatened war, and the only way to find out is to call that bluff. Are the people ready to take that risk, do you think? I don't think so. I mean, David, this country has been at war, not even since 1919, but since 1914. This country also participated in the Great War, yes, as part of the United Kingdom, but there might be anywhere between 30 to 40,000 lives 
lives lost, we still don't even know those numbers. So this country has been at war for a very long time. Are people ready to go back to more of that, to see their examples of what's happening across Europe right now, where there's rebellion, civil war, class conflict, empires being overthrown, certainly. But in the midst of this, tons of bloodshed. Is this what really we're on, we're on for again tonight? I don't know. OK, well, thank you both. We'll be back with you in a moment. Uh, earlier, we joined our reporter, Emmeline Dowling, pounding the pavements with Mary McSweeney in Cork City. Well, tonight, Emmeline is in Bandon to get a feel for the mood in the west of the county. Emmeline. Yes, David. This particular area of West Cork has seen a lot of violence during the war, with over 17 murders in the 12-month period leading up to the truce. One of the most infamous of those murders took place here on the steps of Bandon Church, where RIC Sergeant William Mulheron was killed as he entered the church to attend Mass. A murder that shocked the community and made headlines in Britain. I'm joined now by Father Jeremiah Collin, who came to Sergeant Mulheron's aid and anointed him on this very spot. Father, after what you and this town have been through, what does this treaty mean to you? Well, look, it is a chance for peace. It is a chance to rebuild communities. And if we play our cards right, it is a chance to build something better for Ireland. So you're in favour of the treaty? Well, I couldn't advocate against it in good conscience. I agree with Mick Collins that the people want peace. And I hope he'll come down here and help protect it. I'm sure he'll be warmly welcomed. I couldn't invite war and bloodshed back into this parish again. On that note, we'll return to Dublin, where we still await the results of the vote. Emmeline Dowling there in band and Neve and Dearman are still with us. We are waiting for the results of that vote. We will have it in a couple of minutes. Uh, Neve, if it is a yes, mm -hmm. are the supporters of the treaty actually ready to run the government and run the country? There is no other option. They're going to have to run it. But the question is, how are they going to do that? Yeah, there's an existing counter state of sorts over the last two years. The Republican courts have been quite successful. The provisional police force, maybe less so. So there's something there. But there's also an existing British administration and it remains to be seen what's going to happen to it. Is it going to just be Irishized in a way? Or is there a clean slate about to be written? So Ireland follows the path of Soviet Russia right now, starting from the bottom up, trying to clean everything that's there and start again. We just don't know. OK, Dermot, even under British rule, certain parts of the system, schools and hospitals, uh, were run, by, in effect, by the Catholic Church. Is that going to change once we have our own government in Dublin? I was in Ennis Cathedral on Christmas Day and I listened to Dr Michael Fogarty, the bishop, declare that it would be an act of national madness not to accept this treaty. Cardinal Michael Logue, someone of that seniority, has claimed that this treaty contains everything to make national progress, to advance national progress. Now, I think one of the reasons why that message has been so strong over the last couple of weeks from, from senior church figures is because they are conscious of what they have already in place in healthcare, in education, uh, and all of the various people that they have working all over the country. There will be a power vacuum, regardless of what way this vote goes. Who is going to step into that power vacuum? The Catholic Church will consider itself very well positioned to do that. And if there is to be a new free state, it will be an overwhelmingly Catholic state. OK, well, thank you both for the moment anyway. Well, as we wait to hear news from the Dáil, the thoughts of many will turn to the task facing the new Irish Free State if the agreement brought back from London is endorsed tonight. Chief among the challenges will be to establish the state on a sound financial footing. Sinead has been having a look at the books. Running a state costs money, but so too does waging a war. And the leaders of the second Dáil have proven themselves to be canny operators when it comes to raising revenues. The Minister for Finance, Michael Collins, has been at the heart of these efforts. In a blaze of publicity in April 1919, he successfully launched the National Dáil Loans, persuading almost 150,000 people to subscribe to the scheme in Ireland, raising over £400,000. And de Valera himself was no slouch either when it came to raising funds. 
His high-profile tours of America, as well as those of Mary McSweeney, have helped the external loan scheme to bank over $5 million among Irish communities abroad. And here's the interesting thing. 75% of the certificates issued were in denominations of just $10, suggesting that it is the ordinary, hardworking Irish emigrants who have flocked in huge numbers to support their homeland with their hard-earned savings. And the Irish government has also deployed more unconventional means of securing the financial future of the Republic. One reliable source tonight said that the anti-treaty TD Harry Boland met a delegation of Russian Bolsheviks who were also in New York raising funds and seeking recognition for Vladimir Lenin's revolutionary government. And that the Irish delegation issued the Bolsheviks with a loan at a very high rate of interest of some of this cash that de Valera has raised. And the collateral for the Irish government? No less than the Romanov crown jewels. Now, under Article 5 of the treaty, sorry, the Sinead, Irish free... Sorry to interrupt you, but uh, we have to go straight over to the doll where I believe there is a result. Yes, David, we have a result. The treaty has been ratified by 64 votes to 57. Now, in a moment, I'm hoping to speak to TDs from either side. But it is worth noting the narrow margin for victory. The Dáil Chamber has been almost split down the middle. It is then almost certain that there will be a public vote, which is widely expected to accept the treaty. So indeed, tonight's vote is likely to be the steepest and most significant hurdle the peace deal will face. And in what is sure to be an historic moment, the treaty has now cleared it. Thanks, Greta. Well, there you have it, a truly historic development this evening. The Anglo-Irish Treaty has been officially ratified. Gary, your initial reaction? Well, one part of me is not surprised because all the mood music was that the treaty would be ratified. Uh, popular opinion in the country ha has been for it. Uh, but one other part of me is shocked to my core that President Eamon de Valera has been repudiated by a majority of his own TDs. And I think that will shake him uh, to the core. It's a great affirmation uh, for Michael Collins, for Arthur Griffith, for the plenipotentiaries. Um, and I think a sign of, uh, of maturity in, uh, in Dáil Éireann. But the tightness of the vote, uh, there are ominous, ominous days and nights ahead, I think. Oh. OK, Neve, that is a key point because we were talking earlier about the overwhelming support of the church, the overwhelming support of the media, the overwhelming support of business and apparently the overwhelming support of public opinion. And yet the treaty just scrapes over the line there. Yeah, that narrow majority is a bit worrying. But I have to say, I'm actually really relieved. I'm really relieved. I can't see any other option. I couldn't see any other alternative. OK, thank you both for now. But we are going back over now to Greta Sinnott in UCD where the vote was held tonight. Greta, I believe TDs are now emerging from the chamber. Yes, I'm here with Owen O'Duffy, who voted in favour of the treaty, and Cahill Brew, who of course voted against. Owen O'Duffy, if I can start with you, are you pleased with the result this evening? Well, as you alluded to earlier, it was a close-run thing. I would have preferred if there was a bit more of a consensus. Nobody wants to see a nation divided over this. I tried my best in the debates to unite... The... Well, what do you want, Owen? Do you want us to abandon our principles for the sake of unity? What price does unity come at if we lose our soul in the process? At least some of us haven't forgotten our allegiance to the Republic. Your side doesn't hold monopoly over, over patriotism or principle. Neither side is the custodian of the nation's honour. This treaty, this treaty is, is a staging post on the road to full freedom. And if Cahill Brewer here wants us to turn back on that road, well then I suggest that it is he that is betraying the interests of the people. So why did you back the treaty today? I am for this treaty because my constituents are, because the people are. It will get the British army out of Ireland and it will give us the freedom to make our own army to protect the people's liberties. And who run this army? Mick Collins? The man who people claim won the war, even though he's Minister for Finance. But last time I checked, I'm Minister for Defence. Well, in that capacity, what does this vote mean? Will the IRA row in behind the new state? Or will some new force need to be established? All I can tell you is that I won't be encouraging the army to support this betrayal. In the debates, you referred to the treaty as national suicide. They're strong words. Mr O'Duffy and his ilk are going to walk into this so-called Southern Parliament and try to ratify this. They're going to legitimise British rule, 
take an oath to the king and kill the republic. If we're supporting that, then that is national suicide. We will build a full republic with a strong leadership and freedom for all. And there is nothing that we won't be able to achieve. And I, I strongly believe in that. That there is exactly the kind of naivety that allowed Lloyd George to bamboozle a lot of you. Is it naive to want to build the future of a nation? This is our chance to decide our destiny. It may take time. If you think our side are going to sit around and wait and see, I can tell you now, you have badly underestimated the depth of feeling in that chamber. This isn't over. OK, gentlemen, we're out of time. I'm afraid we'll have to leave it there. There's clearly some road to travel on this issue. Back to you, David. Thank you, Greta. Well, uh, oh, Cahill Brewer there, uh, walking off, clearly furious and leaving no one in doubt as to the depth of his feelings. Sinead, you've been getting some more reaction. Thank you, David. Yes, earlier we told you that 61 votes would be enough to carry the day. And when the moment of truth arrived, the pro-treaty side met that mark and exceeded it. 64 votes in favour and 57 votes against. That means just four TDs had, if four TDs had changed their minds, it would have given victory to the anti-treaty side. In such narrow margins, Ireland's fate has swung in favour of an independent free state. We are told that Michael Collins took to his feet and said, in times of change like this, when countries change from peace to war or war to peace, there are always elements that make for disorder and that make for chaos. He then appealed for some kind of understanding to be reached to preserve the present order in the country. A short emotional speech from a devastated Eamon de Valera followed, closing with the words, the world is watching us now. I'm told he then slumped into a seat, visibly upset. The world is indeed watching us now. David. Thanks, Sinead. Well, we can go now live to Belfast, Jonathan Gregory. Jonathan. Thank you, David. Yes, I'm here now with the mayor of Derry City, Hugh O'Doherty, the first Catholic mayor of that city in over 200 years. Uh, mayor Doherty, as mayor, you're head of the corporation. And unlike many of your northern counterparts, Derry City has maintained a silence on the treaty, which many are interpreting as a form of opposition. So what is your reaction to the news in Dublin this evening? Well, I won't speak for Derry Corporation. I will speak only for myself when I say, this vote is an act of abandonment. That's what it is. The South is washing their hands of their brothers and sisters in the North. If Belfast opts out, as James Craig earlier indicated they would, well, this hands over the lives and liberties of Northern Catholics in shackles. And what about the Boundary Commission? Isn't there a chance that some of the more nationalist areas would be returned to the Republic? You heard Mr Craig earlier. He will sit on Ulster like a rock. Even if some areas were to be returned to the South, there will still be areas where Catholics are in the minority. We will be ostracised on account of our creed. And that's not even the worst of it. If you look at the violence of the last year, the riots in my own town of Derry, this is now a blank check for sectarian violence. And I will tell you now, unless the rights of the minorities are respected, we'll not see peace on this island. OK, thank you, Mayor O'Doherty. A sobering note on what has been an historic night. The future for Northern Ireland remains uncertain. David. Thanks, Jonathan. Well, the future for Northern Ireland does indeed remain uncertain, but a decision has been made for the rest of Ireland. If you're just joining us, I can tell you the news that Dáil Éireann, within the last few minutes, has ratified the Anglo-Irish Treaty by the narrow margin of 64 to 57. Ireland has decided to exit the union with Britain and take back control of its own affairs. But, Neve, we heard there from Carl Brewer. He said, this isn't over. That does sound a bit ominous. This doesn't bode well. It doesn't bode well because, I mean, it, clearly he's always had animosity for Collins from the start, and it now seems to be boiling over into the aftermath of this. Now, it depends how far the anti-treaty side are going to follow him. De Valera clearly upset, but just slumped. I mean, a very different kind of attitude. How are the anti-treaty side going to really respond to this? And hopefully, hopefully they'll come round to accept what indeed has been the democratic will today. Gary, there is clearly a very deep split and we all know that there are a lot of guns in this country uh, at the minute, but surely this division can be contained within the normal political process. 
Well, perhaps not, David. Uh, I'm old enough to remember the aftermath of the American Civil War. You know, a great constitutional crisis could not be averted and uh, war uh, resulted. You know, and the country has been scarred uh, in the 60 years since. So uh, I'm pretty uh, worried, really, about uh, how the anti-treaty um, faction will, uh, will react. Now, Niamh, we heard there from Hugh O'Doherty, the mayor of, of Derry, expressing his disappointment at the treaty. There are also disappointed unionists in what is now or will soon be the Irish Free State. Can minorities on either side of the border have their voices heard in the new political arrangements? Can women have their voices heard? Can Labour ha have its voices heard? Well, I mean, they should have their voices heard. It's here in the treaty. Articles 15 and 16 make reference to minorities. Now, it remains to be seen how far that becomes operative when the new administrative apparatus gets underway. Your point about women, however, I think is also intriguing. Will women be taken seriously? We saw Mary McSweeney trying to get people to listen to her in the doll earlier on. Really, I'm not too sure about that one, David. OK, Gary, uh, back in 1916, even people who disapproved of the use of violence could welcome some of the sentiments in the proclamation. Now, we don't have the republic that was declared in 1916, but we do have, it would appear, an independent Irish government. Can that government deliver on the aspirations of the proclamation? Well, I think it depends on what sort of government emerges. We now have a split, clearly, uh, in the party, and it seems as if two parties are almost inevitably uh, going to emerge. But this is a night when politics has worked, uh, politics has won, um, and in that context, uh, I don't see any reason why the hopes, the aspirations uh, of the ordinary people of Ireland cannot be uh, achieved uh, by those who we elect to dollar and to represent us. And those in the chamber tonight do carry the hopes, the aspirations of the people, and, you know, they better get it right. OK, well, thank you both indeed, and to all of our guests for joining us this evening. And on that note of cautious optimism, we must bring our programme to a close. This night will be remembered for a long time to come, a night when a slender majority of Ireland's public representatives voted for what Michael Collins called the freedom to achieve freedom. Collins, Arthur Griffith and their pro-treaty comrades have come out on the right side of a photo finish vote. Only time will tell what that decision will mean in practice and time too will be needed to heal the division so evident tonight on the floor of the doll. But for now, on this historic evening, thanks for watching and good night. And there is plenty more information about this revolutionary time in Ireland and specifically about the treaty available on rte.ie forward slash history. And one subject in particular that caught my eye on the website is the lesser known role of women in the treaty. Next tonight, EastEnders.